So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our very first talk of the NCU Delta Online Talk series. So I'm Yan Chen Pan, your host tonight. So for those you haven't heard it before, this talk series will be given by, um, I think, all awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship Award. So I think this award is established by the National Central University and uh, the Delta, Fund, uh, Delta Electronics Foundation um, to recognize young scholars. I think it's under the age of 45. So you now who have made uh, outstanding contributions in the field of astronomy. So um, each year, this awardee will be invited to Taiwan and to interact with the local astronomers and the public people. So I think the first award was given um, in 2012, yeah, almost 10 years ago. So, um, so actually the original plan for this year was to, I think, to hold a big event by uh, inviting all the previous awardees to come, you know, come back to Taiwan to celebrate. But uh, things has been pretty complicated uh, due to the COVID-19. So uh, we have decided to um, make everything online, so unfortunately. But the good thing is, you know, so it's more flexible. Maybe we have more people to join uh, this talk and you know, as long as you have a link. So um, uh, to be short, so our speaker today is uh, Professor Masaomi Tanaka yeah, from Tohoku University. So yeah, it's really our great pleasure to have him here. So I think Masaomi received this award in 2017. Is that correct, right? Okay, yeah. I think, yeah, he has a pretty broad interest in astronomy, particularly in time domain astronomy, such as transient, supernovae, kilonovae. And I think he was also involved in um, this great discovery of first kilonova in 2017 by you know, using LIGO Virgo detection. So for those who don't know, the kilonova is like a electromagnetic counterpart of uh, a binary neutron star merger. And I think this is quite a, you know, a great achievement and milestone in modern astronomy. So today his topic, uh, the talk, uh, he's going to you know, talk about the multi messenger astronomy and uh, the origin of the heavy elements in the universe. Okay, so Masaomi, I'll let you take it away. So I think you can share your screen now. Thank you very much. Please. Okay. Thank you very much, Yen Chen. And first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer, including Yen Chen, and also people in NCU, also Delta Electronics Foundation for this opportunity. So I'm really, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give a talk. And as Yen Chen introduced, uh, it was even probably better if I could visit you. But uh, yeah, thanks to this online uh, environment, uh, I'm also happy to give a talk uh, to many of you. So I'd like to thank the audience for joining today's seminar. So today I'd like to uh, talk about the multi messenger astronomy, in particular focusing on the uh, advances of our understanding about the origin of heavy element in the universe. And uh, yeah, this talk is very much related to the gravitation wave astronomy as well. And as Yan Chen introduced, uh, uh, 2017, uh, the first gravitation waves from the neutron star merger have been observed. And I still remember that I visited uh, uh, NCU for this Delta uh, NCU Delta Award just one day after the, the press conference of the <laughs> discovery. So uh, yeah, still I cannot uh, forget about this and I really enjoyed uh, my visit in NCU and all, uh, as well as a uh, uh, public talk at the high school. So, so I hope I, can, I have a uh, next opportunity in the near future. So this talk will be divided, roughly divided into these four parts. And the first part will be very broad. So I think many of you are familiar with the, our current understanding about the origin of the element in the universe. But I'd like to start from the very, begin, uh, very uh, uh, beginning, because that's closely related to today's topic, which is a multi-messenger astronomy and also the origin of heavy elements. And uh, then uh, I will introduce what we learn from the observation of the gravitational waves from Newton's star merger. Uh, 
but this was already about three years ago or four years ago. So I also would like to focus on the, what, what we run, but what is the remaining issue and what is the future prospect? And I hope you, you enjoy the last part of this talk. So let's start from the elements, thinking of, uh, uh, about the elements around us. So we are all now breathing. So we are breathing the air, absorbing the air. And this air consists of the mainly nitrogen, oxygen, and also uh, argon and neon for small fraction. So unconsciously, we are surrounded by a variety of the chemical elements. Please have a look at your hand, for example. So our body uh, consists of mainly uh, of uh, H2O water, but also our bone. Uh, includes carbon and of course this uh we our body includes these elements what about the earth the, the surface of the earth crust that's a the earth is a rocky planet so uh, the main composition is a uh, silicon and oxygen and uh, uh, followed by aluminium iron calcium and so on so we are surrounded by these elements However, the big question is uh, at the beginning of the universe, uh, these elements did not exist because at the time of the Big Bang, the beginning of the universe, the only, uh, the, the, uh, the only hydrogen, helium, and a small amount of lithium existed in our universe. But as you all know, that we are surrounded by a variety of the different elements. So the big question in astronomy and astrophysics is the origin of these elements, where these elements come from, and what kind of uh, astronomical object made these elements. So this is the topic of today's talk. So, so you know the periodic table and the hydrogen, helium, and lithium are the first three elements with the least atomic number, smallest atomic number. Then the, today's uh, topic is uh, the element uh, heavier than the lithium. So uh, where are they from? But uh, actually up to iron, from carbon to iron, we have a really good understanding thanks to the, the intensive uh, research uh, in the last 50, more than 50 years. And the answer is a uh, star. So these elements uh, were made inside of the star. So this is a, a brief overview of the life of the star, entire life of the star. Uh, for example, uh, take, uh, take the massive star as an example. Massive star I, I, uh, means the mass of the star is probably greater than uh, 10 times of the sun. Then inside of, the, the, inside of these stars, the many heavy elements are produced, synthesized. And finally, such a star explodes as a supernova which leaves neutron stars or black hole. So what is, is happening inside of the, these stars? So this is a nuclear burning. So you, uh, you know that uh, our sun, in, inside of the, our sun, the hydrogen is, uh, is converted to helium, which produces uh, energy, nuclear energy. And this is the reason why our sun is so, so luminous. But uh, when the, the star exhausts the hydrogen, then for the case of the massive star, the, the helium is uh, converted to uh, carbon and oxygen. And this kind of uh, nuclear reaction continues up to iron. Of course, the, the, the stars are uh, gases. So iron is not a metal iron, and the, the solid iron, but a gas iron. But uh, these heavy elements are produced inside of the star. So the speaking about the origin of the element from like a carbon, oxygen, uh, up to iron, the main origin is the inside of the star. But uh, if this happens just inside of the star, then uh, we cannot take iron, for example, because iron exists uh, very inside of the star. But iron is the most stable uh, nucleus, and uh, 
finally star collapses、uh, because iron,、uh, there's no more nuclear burning after iron. Then the star cannot、uh, support the own gravity. Then star starts to collapse into the center of the star, which causes collapse. And, uh, and uh, this collapse,、uh, the central part of the star collapses. And finally, this makes a, a very strange star, extremely high density,、uh, which, calls a neutron, which is called neutron star. Or maybe some cases it、uh, becomes a black hole. Maybe some,、uh, many of you are familiar with. Then,、uh, when neutron star is formed inside of the star, massive star, then the outer part of the star、uh, bounces at the surface of the neutron star. And、uh, finally, the outer part of the star explodes or it expands into the、uh, interstellar space. This is called a supernova explosion. Although the exact mechanism is still unclear,、uh, we uh, uh, observe this phenomena、uh, in the observation of astronomy. So we know that star, some stars explode. Then,、uh, when stars explode, then elements produced inside of the star are ejected into the interstellar space. And in the long history of the universe, This kind of stellar, evolu the, the stellar evolution and the、uh, explosion of the star supernova, and also again,、uh, another generation of the star is formed by the gas ejected from the supernova. And again, this,、uh, uh, this process happens in the next generation star, and、uh, also next generation star e x p l o d e as a supernova. So, this kind of cycle happens so, so many times. And finally, our universe is a,、uh, has a lots of heavy elements. So, this is an actual image of the supernova explosion in our, uni、uh, in our galaxy. So, this is a famous cloud nebula. So,、uh, speaking about the origin of the element around us, so thanks to the, the nuclear burning inside of the star and also the supernova explosion, and finally,、uh, the element. Comes to the sun and also the earth, and also this goes to the element around us, like our, the air, and our body, and the earth. So, so far, I was talking about the、uh, origin of the element up to iron. And、uh, this understanding is、uh, quite matured, I would say. Of course,、uh, there are several k i n d of supernova explosion and、uh, different masses of the star, but roughly speaking, the element up to iron is、uh, thought to be produced by, the st、uh, by stars and the supernova explosion. But as you can see in the periodic table, there are so many other elements heavier than iron. And today's main topic is、uh, th these heavier elements. Including, for example, the famous element is a gold or a platinum. So, the origin of these heavy elements are still not understood. So, which means no one knows the exact answer. So,、uh, last a few decades,、uh, astronomers and astrophysicists have been studying the origin of these elements,、like、including gold and platinum. And,、uh, And、uh, this is very much related to the multi messenger astronomy. So, I today I'd like to、uh, introduce the, the recent understanding of this,、uh, the origin of these elements. Then,、uh, I will introduce the multi messenger, the why multi messenger astronomy is related to the origin of heavy elements. That sounds completely a different topic, but actually, th these two topics are closely related to each other. So, as I said, the origin of the heavy element, heavier than iron, are not well understood, which means we do not know where they were made, where they are from. However, the, we have a good understanding how to produce such e l e m e n t or what is a necessary condition. 
And the key to understand that is a neutron capture, neutron. So iron is a stable uh, 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 element, and it's very difficult to put more proton. So to increase the atomic number in the periodic table, you have to increase the number of proton. But this is uh, no more possible inside of the star. So this is a difficulty why uh, the heavier elements are not produced inside of the, sun, uh, the star. So instead of putting proton, adding proton, we can add neutron because neutron does not have a charge. So there's no uh, repulsive force. So anyway, we can add neutron. But as you know, e even if you add neutron, ion is still ion. So this is an isotope of ion. But if you have, a, a, if you add many neutron, then finally uh, this is subject to the radioactive decay, and uh, inside of the nucleus the uh, neutron is changed to proton, which effectively increases the, the atomic number. So this should be the process to make heavier elements. And roughly speaking, uh, this neutron capture process, uh, neutron capture nuclear synthesis can be divided into two processes. One is the so-called slow process or S process. Uh, S process, slow means uh, the, the time scale of the neutron capture is slower than the radioactive decay. So if uh, one neutron is added, then radioactive uh, decay happens, and one neutron, radioactive decay, and so on. The other process uh, is called a rapid process or R process. Uh, rapid means the neutron capture is more rapid than the new uh, radioactive decay or beta decay, so we can put so many neutrons rapidly, then finally it decays. So by uh, these two processes, different kind of elements are produced. And the S process uh, is known to produce uh, like a volume or lead. And the rapid process uh, is a process to make a gold, platinum, and uranium. And for the case of the slow process, we, we know that uh, this happens in the, the late stage of uh, the stars, stellar evolution. And if we observe such a star, we can actually uh, observe the excess of these elements. So about half of the heavy element beyond iron is made by S process. So roughly speaking, about half of the heavy, the origin of about half uh, of the heavy element are relatively well understood. However, the, we still do not know where this R process, rapid neutron capture process happened in the universe. This is the reason why I first introduced the gold and the platinum, because we still do not know the origin of these elements. So we need uh, the lots of neutron uh, because uh, we need a rapid neutron capture process, which requires a, a high neutron density or high neutron flux. So probably the origin of these R process elements uh, are related to the phenomena close to the neutron star. A uh, neutron star is the final stage of the massive star, as I explained, so, uh, which is left behind the supernova explosion. So neutron star, by the name of, uh, you can guess that the neutron, there, there are lots of neutron. So if we can use the neutron uh, from the new, uh, neutron star, probably this is a good side of the rapid neutron capture process. So by this reason, the historically, the two scenarios have been uh, considered to be the, the good side of the R process uh, nucleosynthesis. Uh, one is a supernova explosion, and the second is a merger of two neutron stars. And I already introduced a supernova, and the goodness of the supernova is we know uh, how often this happens. This is about one supernova per one galaxy per hundred year. But 
that probably it is difficult to have to have a, uh, enough neutron in the case of the supernova. I will explain this answer in one minute. For the case of the neutron star mergers, this is a robust uh, site for the R process nuclear synthesis. Also, I will explain this soon. However, we did not know that uh, how often this kind of uh, event happens in the universe and how much of the material is ejected from this kind of this kind of phenomena. So there are pros and cons in either scenario. So, and I would say this is still a mystery. I do not have the clear answer yet. But uh, 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 in the last decade or so, uh, there have been a lot of study uh, focusing on the origin of the R process element in the supernova scenario or neutron star merger scenario. One of the difficulty in supernova is the presence of neutrino. So neutron star, around the neutron star or the surface of the neutron star is neutron rich. However, as, as I said, the, the supernova is an explosion of the star. And to have the strong explosion, the outer part of the star should absorb neutrino because neutrino carries a lot, uh, the majority of the energy in this system. Then uh, even if you have lots of neutron, uh, you also have to absorb neutrino, which means uh, neutrino is absorbed by neutron, which produces a proton. So, to have a strong explosion or successful explosion of the star, we want to have a more efficient neutrino absorption. However, to have the R process, we want to keep neutron as it is. So probably this is not reconciled. Uh, and uh, some, but by this reason, uh, at least it is uh, thought to be difficult to produce R process element in a normal Normal means a neutrino-driven supernova explosion. But this does not mean the supernova is already excluded because uh, some of the supernova may be, uh, may explode uh, driven by, not driven by neutrino, but maybe a uh, strong magnetic field and so on. So this is still theoretical studies and uh, we do not have a clear answer but at least a recent theoretical study for normal neutrino-driven supernova suggests that it seems difficult to produce a strong R process in supernova because of the neutrino absorption. Uh, compared with the situation of supernova, the, mass uh, the, uh, the situation of neutron star merger is somewhat simpler. So this is a numerical simulation of the, the neutron star merger. So this uh, shows the density contour of the neutron star mergers. And when two neutron star merge, then uh, some fraction of the material is ejected into the interstellar space. So neutron star is an object with about a solar mass, one solar mass, 1.5 solar mass, and with a radius of about 10 kilometer, which means that the gravity is extremely strong. But uh, when two neutron star merge with each other, the small fraction of material is ejected by the tidal force, and as well as the shock heating because two neutron star collide with each other. So among about one solar mass of the material, the probably 1% of the material is ejected by uh, the neutron star mergers. And since this eject mass uh, material comes from the, the surface of the neutron star. This is extremely neutron rich, and this is a very good site for the uh, neutron capture, rapid neutron capture process, R process. So, this is a mass ejection from neutron star mergers. So, since this does not, so far, this does not in, involve the neutrino, so this is a somewhat simpler than the case of the supernova because supernova can explode only after the enough absorption of the neutrino. But this is anyway ejected by the collision and also tidal force. So this is the reason why uh, people think that the neutron star merger is a robust site of the R process. 
then uh, this is an exact uh, uh, path of the R process nuclear synthesis inside of the ejected material from neutron star mergers. So sorry, this is a bit complicated here, but this is chart of the nuclei, and uh, x-axis is a neutron number, and the y-axis is a proton number, and these gray dots are the stable nuclei, and the color-coded part is a, a abundance, high abundance of the nuclei, these nuclei, and uh, sorry, this. so starting from the neutron, proton, the ion is produced and the neutron capture takes place. Neutron capture means the right hand side of this figure. Then uh, after uh, adding many neutrons, then radioactive decay happens, which goes to the, the then the, the nuclei go back to the state, uh, the stability line here. So neutron capture takes place, then uh, beta decay happens like this. Then uh, ion is here, so this uh, you can see that um, uh, uh, much heavier elements are produced in this environment. So this is a path of the, the R process. By the way, uh, S process is a, uh, uh, in the S process, uh, radioactive decay is always followed by one neutron capture. So it goes up along this line. So this is the reason why the, the R process and the S process produce a different element. And the red line shows the magic number of nuclei and the neutron capture tend to be stopped around here, around here. So you can see some high abundance here so our processes tend to be stopped around here and the radioactive decay goes here. But S process tend to be stopped around here. So this is the reason why S process and R process produce a different kind of element. Okay, so when two neutron stars merge, then some material is ejected and the neutron capture takes place and the radioactive decay also takes place. Then uh, this is a kind of a, a, a hot expanding gas heated by radioactivity. So please assume this is ejected material from neutron star merger. This is about 1% of the solar mass. Then uh, radioactive decay takes place inside of the, this material. The typical size of this sphere is about 10 to 15 centimeter. The typical velocity is about 0.1 C which is close to the escape velocity of the neutron star. And if you expand this system for uh, one week or so, then it will be 10 to 15 centimeter, which is about the size of the solar system. Then radioactive decay uh, produce gamma ray and the beta particle, and also alpha decay happens, helium nuclei also produce, uh, also produced. Uh, but these uh, part high energy particles cannot easily escape because although this is a relatively big uh, uh, sphere of the gas, uh, we still have about uh, 0.01 solar mass, 1% of the solar mass. So these are the, uh, absorbed or stopped by the material. And finally, this gas is heated up and then uh, typical temperature of the gas is about uh, 5,000 Kelvin or 10,000 Kelvin, which produced uh, the optical and the infrared photon as a thermal process. Then again, optical and the infrared photon cannot easily escape at the beginning, but uh, it uh, uh, gradually diffuses out. And the uh, interesting thing is that uh, this sphere is a very special or very peculiar sphere in the universe because uh, Basically, most of the gas consists of the heavy element, heavier than iron. So there's no such system in, in the universe except for the neutron star merger. So this is a, actually a very exciting, interesting thing as a physics. So photon in, uh, mainly interact with matter uh, by bound-bound transition of heavy elements. So, so this system is actually a bit difficult to uh, study because uh, there's no analogs of this system. 
So for example, our sun is about, about uh, mainly composed of hydrogen and helium and very small amount of uh, heavy element, heavier element. And even for the case of the supernova, still almost uh, entire part is hydrogen or helium or in, in, in the most extreme case is iron. But this uh, gas uh, include only element heavier than iron. So this is actually interesting thing of this phenomena. So we can calculate how, what kind of, uh, by the way, and this is called Kironova as Yen Chen introduced at the beginning. So this, uh, the diffuse out photon, diffusing out photon is called the Kironova that we can actually observe by the telescopes. We can calculate what kind of emission is expected from this kind of system. And this is a, a, a magn absolute magnitude, like a brightness, uh, brighter in the y axis, uh, brighter in this side, fainter in this side, and the x axis is a time after the mergers. So neutron star merger is a phenomenon within one second because this is very small scale and dynamical time scale is about uh, 10 milliseconds or so. But this photon diffusion takes about 10 days. Uh, so this is a, and a, from observational point of view, this phenomenon has a time scale of about 10 days. And the different lines show the different wavelengths and the bluish color shows the optical light curve and the, the reddish color is the infrared. So roughly speaking, this phenomenon is bright in the infrared and very uh, faint and the, very, the, the evolution is very rapid in optical. Now, this is also very strange. For example, case of the supernova, supernova is brightest in the optical wavelengths and the infrared is fainter. But this phenomenon, kilonova, is brighter in the infrared, expected to be brighter in the infrared. And this is actually related to the uh, chemical composition. So as I said, the, the ejected material from the neutron star merger has a very peculiar chemical composition. So uh, the Ejector, the ejected material uh, include only heavier element, heavier than iron. Then uh, actually this periodic table is useful because the periodic table is organized uh, according to the location of the, uh, the electron shell, which you should have learned in the quantum physics. So for the case of the iron, the outermost electron is located uh, is in the D shell. And uh, this shows the energy level of singly ionized ion from zero to five electron volt. And uh, one electron volt is about the energy range of optical photon. So optical photon feel the bound bound transition of this, these uh, excited levels. So element and the ions are excited by photon uh, abs uh, absorbing the ions absorb photon uh, and excited to the excited levels. But the ion is a subdominant element in the case of the neutron star mergers. And in the case of the neutron star mergers, the more heavy element are, uh, heavier element exist. And in particular, these element uh, called lanthanoid, which has an open F shell, uh, has a very complicated uh, excited levels. So this is a, the same diagram for the uh, singly ionized neosimum. And uh, this is zero, again, zero to five electron volt. And you can see so many excited levels. And uh, so energy levels are densely packed, which means that delta E is smaller for the case of the lanthanoid. Delta E is smaller, which means that uh, this is sensitive to the longer wavelength photon which means the lanthanoid are more efficient absorber for infrared photon. So thanks to the, the presence of this element, uh, kilonova, the property of kilonova is very different from supernova, which is an infrared bright. Kilonova is an infrared bright object. But this is not so simple in reality. So uh, for the simplicity, I just uh, mentioned that uh, the neutron star merger ejects some material. However, the, also the, the central part, the neutron star remains for the short time. And this is actually a strong emitter of neutrino. 
So then the situation in this region is similar to supernova, which are the, this is, is subject to the neutrino absorption, which reduces the fraction of neutrino, uh, sorry, neutron. And uh, then the R process is not so efficient. So probably uh, this environment is not so lanthanoid rich, or I would say lanthanoid poor. Then this uh, ejected material is relatively similar to supernova, which should be bright in the optical wavelengths. So we have this kind of theoretical uh, expectation. So color of kilonova is an important probe uh, for the abundance of heavy element, and which also which is determined by the physics of the neutron star margins. And this link is available thanks to the, the atomic property and. Uh, Last several years, uh, several groups have been working hard for the, to construct the atomic opacity of these heavy elements. So this was a theoretical expectation before the uh, observation of the neutron star mergers. So this is about half of my talk. So I will give a short summary. Why this is a, uh, the multi messenger astronomy is related to the origin of heavy element. So neutron star merger is a strong emitter, strong source of the gravitation wave. And when two neutron star merge, then some material is ejected, then uh, heavy elements are synthesized. Sorry, this is a solid, but in, in reality, this is a gas. And radioactive decays produce the powers, electromagnetic uh, transient, which is called kilonova. So by combining the gravitation wave observation and the electromagnetic wave observation, uh, we can study how, if, whether neutron star mergers are producing the heavy elements or not. So this is a link between the multi-messenger astronomy and the origin of the heavy element. So if you have any short question, I'm happy to answer it. I cannot see the chart. No. Um, yeah, so far we don't have, but yeah, we have one question from, yeah, person. Let me see. Can you, can you see the chat? Or if not, I can read it for I you. I can see, but I do not see any message. Is it correct? Oh, yeah, it's a direct message to me. Okay. Oh, I see. Then please read it. So, um, other than so called normal supernovae, which are neutrino driven, is there an abnormal supernova in which neutrino is not the driving force of explosion? Thank you. That's, that's a the question. Yeah, that's an extremely good question. Uh, or, uh, <laughs> we are not entirely sure of the explosion mechanism of the supernova. So, but people call that the neutrino driven explosion is a normal. Then the question is what is abnormal? The one, one possible abnormal scenario is uh, the explosion by the strong magnetic field. So if the star has a magnetic field and rapidly rotating, then magnetic field, uh, magnetic field is amplified. Then magnetic pressure gets higher, then star can explode. So if such scenario happens, then star can explode even before neutrino absorption becomes effective, in such a case, the supernova, such a supernova can, pro, uh, can provide a good site of the uh, R process. So this is called a magneto, magneto-driven explosion or MHD scenario. So this is one of the, how to say, uh, one of the most exciting abnormal scenario. Okay, great, good question. So any other questions before we move to the second half of your talk? Okay. Yeah, someone raised his hand. Maybe if you want, you can just speak directly or type your message. Hi, uh, this is Huey. Uh, I have a question about, uh, six, several questions about the R process. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. I, I... Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, how much do we know about the R process, or is it purely theory? Uh, I I'll I'll speak the uh, the questions first, then then you can 
you can answer af afterwards. And, uh, how, how much do we know about the R process? Uh, is it purely theoretical, or there are some some uh, either evidence or or something that uh, more more realistic that that we know about it? And also, if we don't know much about it, how do we know or how do we define its rapid rather than slow, slower than than the the, the regular? regular process that we, we understand. And then uh, also during the, the, the neutral, star, neutral star merger, uh, I, I would assume that certainly it's not only the heavy elements that are produced. There are also some, some lighter ones that, that we know that are, are produced in, 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 an, uh, in the area that we, we, we understand. And do we, is it possible to know what would be the, the percentage mm -hmm. or how much, certainly I, I know it's not, not possible to get precise numbers, but, but uh, we, we, I, I will assume that it's, it's much easier to get lighter elements through this process than the heavier ones. But is it possible to, to, to find a theory or something uh, about uh, proportional values of, of different different elements during this process. Yeah, thank that, you. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I will uh, answer from the last question. So, in terms of the observation of kilonova or neutron star merger, so far it is still difficult to identify one element one by one. For example. I have 1% of the gold, I have a 0.5% of platinum, that's still not possible. So that is the current situation. And uh, back to the first question, that's a really good question. So if it is purely theoretical or is there any uh, proper independent clue or not? So this I'm now show, showing the cosmic abundance or solar abundance as a function of atomic number. So this is a, a how much fraction of the element exists in, at the surface of the sun or solar system. So actually, uh, the concept of the R process and the S process have been developed uh, in closely related to this figure. So as I showed in the movie, so R process goes to this way. So it is very far from the stability, stable nuclei. But all, uh, S process means uh, one radioactive decay is always followed by one neutron, sorry, one neutron capture is followed by one radioactive decay. So it goes up along this line. And we have a magic number of nuclei, which means this element tend to be uh, produced a lot and also this. So this element is expected to be abundant if S process happens. Same is true here. And this, this element is expected to be abundant if R process happens in the universe. So, so far, I was just talking from theoretical point of view. But actually, we have a good imprint in the solar system, solar abundance. So you can see that the, the, the volume in our uh, solar system is actually abundant as uh, compared with the surrounding element, which is actually hint that S process is actually happening in the universe. And the same is true for our process. So we have uh, some excess in here and here, uh, which is uh, the sign of the R process. So actually, the uh, I explained it from the theoretical point of view, but there is some experimental or observational indication. Does it answer your question? Yes, yes. And uh, sorry, I forgot the second question. So if it is purely theoretical, then can we get some information or not? Yeah, so I partly answered this, yes. And another interesting thing is uh, we can, this is about the sun, but we can also observe the other stars. So sorry, this is a bit complicated figure, but uh, 
we can also measure the chemical abundance of the other stars inside of our galaxy. And uh, interestingly, uh, different star shows kind of similar abundance pattern. And the uh, uh, blue line here is a solar system abundance. So some stars do not have much metal, and some star has a lot of metal, but the relative fraction is somewhat similar. So which means, again, means our process is somewhat universal. So this kind of uh, process is ha actually happening in the universe. So then this is an independent indicate, observational indication that our process is actually happening in the universe. Then the question is, of course, where it is. And this is still a, not, not well understood. OK. So yeah, I think I see one more question from the message. Maybe that's uh, the last question. So I have a question about the magic number. Can you explain more about it? Why S process and R process will be you know, produce more abundance? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, magic number is a property of the nuclei, and uh, this has a, a higher binding energy uh, compared to the surrounding nuclei, which means nu uh, nuclei tend to stay along this line. So this is more com comfortable or <laughs> more stable. So then if you have a constant flux of the neutron, then neutron capture tend to stop here. But if you have more neutron, this goes. But this tend to be stopped. So this is kind of a barrier. So for the case of the uh, R process, oh, I'm sorry. For the case of the R process, you can see that this tend to stop and the radioactive decay happens a bit earlier like this. So this is a property of the nuclei. So and the uh, exact origin why this is uh, one to eight is uh, still under debate from a purely theoretical point of view. But we know that uh, uh, nuclei prefer the neutron number of one to uh, 82 and so on. So thanks to this magic number, we have a, a distinct peak in the solar abundance according to S process and R process, S process and R process. So in turn, this this also suggests the presence of magic number. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I th I, yeah, I think I, yeah, I suggest we move on to your second part. Okay. We will answer the questions later after your talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So the, the summary of the first part is a neutron star merger is a gravitational wave source and the uh, origin can uh, produce the heavy element and can also provide the electron emission. So that, that clearly this is exciting to detect and uh, in 2017, the first gravitation wave from Newton's technology was detected. So the astronomers all over the world uh, searched for the emission uh, of a kilonova Newton's emission from Newton's technology. So from the observation of gravitational waves, we cannot really pin down the position of the uh, source. So instead, we have a, this kind of estimate on, on the sky. So the gravitational wave should have come in this region. So this is a galactic plane, and this is a very wide field. But this is, uh, we can search the new object inside of the, this field. And uh, so many telescope time have been devoted to search for the new transient object after the gravitational wave detection. And uh, we found that the uh, new object appeared on top of this galaxy. So this is a galaxy, and this is a new source that appeared after the observation of the gravitational waves. So this is just a color image. And uh, this is the image uh, taken at the one day after the gravitational wave detection. And uh, this brighter part is a galaxy. Uh, at a 40 megaparsec distance. And the uh, first day, uh, this, uh, there was a very bright uh, object. And after one week, uh, this gets fainter. And this color image is actually made by combining the optical and the infrared image. So red 
color in this image means an uh, infrared storm. So you can already see that this is like a bluish, which means an uh, optical storm. And this is a red, which means that this object is uh, emitting strong infrared. So for me, this is a really exciting image because this really looks like a kilonova. So more uh, quantitative figure is something like this. So this is, uh, again, magnitude as a function of time. And uh, solid line is the same as before, uh, color coded according to the wavelengths. And the dots, small dots show the actual observational data compiled by these uh, many, many groups all over the world. And you can clearly see that the infrared bright object, which is a smoking gun signal of the kilonova. So thanks to this agreement, uh, we were sure that this, this object com is coming from the neutron star mergers. So infrared bright transient means a signature of the lanthanoid element. So uh, at least uh, we can say that neutron star merger produce lanthanoid element. And from the brightness, we can also estimate the mass, which is ejected from the neutron star merger, which is about 3% of the solar mass or so. And from the color, we can also estimate the fraction of lanthanoid, which is about 1%. So this is actually the answer to the previous question. So we cannot say gold 1%, platinum 1%, and so on, unfortunately. But roughly speaking, as a sum of the lanthanoid elements, we can say the uh, uh, rough fraction of the lanthanoid, which is still a pity. <laughs> of course, this is exciting discovery, but uh, uh, clearly the next step is identifying the exact element. And also at the beginning, uh, optical emission is brighter. So sorry, this is a bit uh, complicated figure, but uh, this is a flux as a function of wavelengths. And the black line shows the actual observation, observed the spectrum. And the red one is a model of the red kilonova. So red kilonova model clearly underproduced the flux in the optical at the, uh, about one day after the mergers, which means yeah, something like this. So some part of the material ejected from the neutron star merger should be lanthanoid free, which produced a supernova-like blue transient, blue kilonova. So, so neutron star merger also produced a lighter R process element, lighter than uh, lanthanoid. But again, it's very difficult to say uh, how much fraction and which elements are produced. So this is clearly the next step. But uh, 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 overall, uh, thanks to this uh, multi-messenger observation, gravitation wave and electromagnetic wave observation, uh, uh, people, uh, we found that uh, neutron star mergers are actually producing the heavy elements. So this is the first observational evidence that, that uh, ab about the site, exact site of the R process, nuclear synthesis. Uh, the question is, if this is enough to explain the total amount of the R process element in our galaxy, so we know the rough fraction, how much fraction of the heavy elements are included in our solar system, which is about uh, uh, one, 10 to minus 7 in the mass fraction. Then uh, this figure is a bit uh, complicated, but uh, uh, it x-axis is the event rate of the phenomena uh, in, the rate, uh, in the unit of the uh, per year per galaxy. So supernova rate is uh, one event per galaxy per 100 year, which means 10 to minus 2 per year. So this is supernova rate. And the uh, y-axis mean, means the required ejector mass. Uh, to explain the total amount of our process in our galaxy. Please have a look at the black line. So if the object is located on top of the black line, then uh, it can explain the total amount of the R process element. So if the, for the case of the supernova, if one supernova produces 10 to minus 4 solar mass of R process element, then it can uh, explain the total amount of the R process element. If the event rate is low, 
then one event should produce more. So this is the reason why this is the uh, anti-correlation. Then uh, from the observation of the gravitation waves, we can roughly estimate the event rate of the neutron star modules, which is about 10 to minus five uh, event per year per galaxy around this range. But this is still very uncertain because we have only a few events so far, or well, one event at the time of 2017. So x-axis is from the gravitation wave observation, and the y-axis can be estimated, the ejector mass can be estimated from the optical or infrared electromagnetic observation. And for the case of the uh, GW17-17, the ejected mass is estimated about 10 to uh, 0.05 or so in total. So this is about this range. So, so far, neutron star merger is consistent with the total amount of the Arcos element in our galaxy. However, as you can see, the event rate is super uncertain, and we have only one kilonova so far. So probably some of the kilonova do not produce a lot of Arcos element. Some may produce a bit more. So we should understand uh, how often neutron star merger happens and how much of the material is ejected by the neutron star merger. So this is still beginning, but uh, at least uh, so far it is roughly consistent with the origin of the heavy element. So what we have learned from this March messenger observation, so red component of the kilonova was uh, observed, which uh, means production of lanthanoid element. But all, at the same time, blue component has been uh, observed, which means the uh, production of lighter heavy element. Brighter than lanthanum. And the ejected mass uh, times the event rate is, is called the production rate. It's so far consistent with the total amount, but as you can see, that the data large uncertainty so far. So, more important thing is open issue. So, as uh, you have already asked and uh, I, I already mentioned, so we still do not know the conclusive evidence about uh, each individual element, so which elements are produced. So no evidence of the gold or platinum. And uh, also I showed the solar abundance, and uh, it's not clear that the neutron star merger produced a similar abundance pattern to the solar abundance, because what we can say is only this kind of rough information. And the last question is that neutron star merger are really producing enough amount of elements. To, to understand that we, have to measure the event rate accurately, and we have to understand the variety or diversity of the ejected mass. So this is a clearly the, the, the open issue. But, so this was a really the good first step, but we have to understand uh, more things to really understand the origin of heavy element. So just quickly, I will uh, uh, introduce some recent works. So I think many of you are interested in the actual element, which elements are produced. So actually, the, thanks to the extensive observation of the GW17 or GW17 uh, good time series of the spectrum has been uh, obtained. So this is actually, <laughs> this includes rich information. So some absorption line appears, some absorption appear, maybe some maybe interpreted as emission line as well. Um, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to decode this, read this spectrum because uh, again, this gas is extremely peculiar. So it includes only heavy elements. And uh, also there are Neutron star mergers are expanding with extremely high speed, like 10% of the speed of, of light. So Doppler shift is very significant. So that also makes the identification of the element difficult. But so far, only this trough, this absorption feature is identified to be strontium line. So at least two independent uh, uh, Calculation uh, shows a consistent result. One is by Watson et al. and uh, uh, 
uh, second is uh, uh, Domo Z uh, from our group. So probably this is a strong chain. So strong chain is a relatively light element. Uh, so this is not really heavy uh, process element. So the question is where, uh, whether we have, we can identify uh, other features in this spectrum. And unfortunately, it's not possible yet so far, uh, partly because the atomic data are not complete. So we suffer from lack of atomic data, in particular in, in the infrared uh, wavelength range, because stellar spectroscopy has a really good history in the optical wavelengths, but the infrared wavelengths is difficult in terms of the astronomical observation and also lab ex uh, experiment. So recently, uh, Nana Edomoto uh, from Top University uh, did a detailed spectral calculation. And uh, she, uh, she found that uh, this feature can be produced by strong tumor. But at the same time, it's interesting that uh, uh, she also found that uh, uh, calcium line can also appear because strong tumor and the calcium has a very similar atomic structure. And sorry, now I remember the, the second question. So the, some of the lighter elements may be produced or not. And the, the answer is yes. So strontium is relatively light and calcium is even lighter element. And uh, in particular, the, the lanthanoid less, lanthanoid poor region, uh, which is affected by neutrino absorption, neutron star margin also produce relatively light r process element and which can be tested by the future observation of Kironobu. But uh, we clearly need more events because we have only one event, one object. So this reminds <laughs> us about the beginning of the stellar spectroscopy. So we need at least several of the objects and the first we classify the spectral feature, and uh, gradually we start to be, start to identify the chemical element. So I think uh, the future is bright, and uh, we can observe many uh, more neutron star mergers and uh, start to understand the spectral variety. And uh, also, we shouldn't forget about the, the construction of good atomic data, and hopefully we can identify these features in the spectrum. So this is not yet done, but I think we should uh, we should uh, work on that direction. And uh, about the event rate, uh, so far uh, we have only one event in 2017 and uh, another event in 2019 for neutron star mergers, and now we are here. So still the sensitivity of gravitation wave detectors are improving and the coming uh, uh, upcoming observing run, we expect to detect more event, more neutron star merger event. Then the estimate of the event rate will be more accurate. And at the same time, we can also understand the variety of the uh, kilonova emission or heavy element production. So as I said, there is a, actually one event in 2019, but unfortunately that this second neutron star merger event the sky position was not uh, accurately determined, which is uh, shown in this uh, map. So this is, uh, <laughs> from observational uh, point of view, this is really <laughs> nightmare. And uh, uh, of course, many telescopes uh, have searched the Kironova in this region, but uh, no convincing counterpart was identified. It was a bit far. The first event was 40 megaparsec, and the second event is about 150 megaparsec. But uh, this situation will be surely improved uh, in near future because so far the two LIGO detector and the one Borg detector is operating, and uh, Kagura in Japan is joining the, the gravitation wave observation, and uh, eventually LIGO India will also start. Then the sky localization of the gravitation wave event will, be, uh, will become more accurate. So this is just a demonstration. So this is the first gravitational event, gravitation wave event in 2015. So the, at that time, sky localization is about 600 square degrees. 
But if we have the, all the detector for, for this case, LIGO, GROGON, and KAGRA, then localization can be as accurate as this black circle. So this is about one degree. So if you have a relatively wide field uh, telescope, like a super uh, in Hawaii, or many of one meter class telescope has this kind of one degree, two degree field of view, then the follow-up observation is relatively straightforward. So position of the gravitation wave is a uh, pin down using a few degree, and if you point at uh, your telescope, then you can immediately find a kilometer. So I think uh, I'm very much in, uh, looking forward to this kind of error, and uh, hopefully we can detect uh, more Newton star mergers and more kilonovar, and uh, this will clearly lead the, the uh, advance our understanding about the origin of the heavy element. So I think I'm running out of the time, so I stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Masomi. Yeah, fantastic talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we're now open for questions. You can either type your message, send a direct message to me, or raise your hand, speak up. Any questions for Masomi? So, okay. Well, let me start one. So, um, so by fitting the light curves, maybe we can get, I mean, the geometry of this kilonova because it looks like it's kind of depends on your viewing angle. And yeah, yeah. I can see this. Yeah. So is, is it like a free parameter which can be in your feeding? Like, um, I don't know how people have the model of the kilonova is taking this into account. Mm. Thank you. That's a very important question. Uh, yes, we, uh, of course, Kironova is not a spherical, and as you, you can see here. And uh, angle depend viewing angle dependence is expected to be very strong because uh, mainly the equatorial region has a heavier element, which blocks photons more effectively. So roughly speaking, the polar direction is brighter, bluer, and the more equator is redder, fainter, thanks to the, due to the presence of lampan rich uh, ejector. But the exact configuration is not so clear from theoretical point of view. So we can make uh, many of this kind of model and uh, uh, take the viewing angle as a free parameter. But then it Maybe the number of free parameters is too large. So beauty of the multi messenger observation is from the observation of the gravitation wave, we can have a good guess about the viewing angle. So best thing is a fixing viewing angle from the gravitation wave observation and, and observe many events. Then we, we will finally reconstruct this kind of structure yeah. by many observations. So if we do not know the viewing angle at all, then it's a bit difficult to guess only from kilonova property. Right. That's my, my feeling. Yeah. I mean, we still need you know, a large sample. You know. Still, we still have one event. It's hard, really hard to say anything. Uh, uh, OK, yeah, we have more questions coming in here. So again, from a question from Wang. So does the last page, the last page of your slide, I think, Mean that once all the gravitational wave observatories work together, we human can definitely identify the optical counterparts. If all the gravitational wave observatories work together, mm -hmm. like the three, yeah. yes, yes. can we yeah. def definitely detect the <laughs> kilonova? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, yeah, gravitational waves uh, detectors are working together. So uh, localization will be surely get better. The question is if we can really detect the kilonova always, and that depends on the distance. So gravitation wave sensitivity gets better, which means you can detect the gravitation wave from more distant objects. 
then Kilonova gets fainter. And uh, as we, I discussed with Yen Chen, so depending on the viewing angle, maybe Kilonova is so faint. So actually, it's not so clear if we can really always detect a Kilonova. Right. But I would say non detection is even meaningful because which means a Kilonova does not happen or it's very faint. So I want to accumulate this kind of information too. Then I think we will uh, understand the Kilonova better. This is uh, mainly because that, for example, this second case of the neutron star merger, that, that some of the neutron star was very massive. And if the two neutron star has a, a, a higher mass, then probably there's no mass ejection because it promptly cracks to the black hole. So it's quite possible that the neutron star merger do not produce zero, do not produce any kilonova. So that's also possible. And that's also interesting in terms of the physics. So my question is, uh, I want to observe Kilonova, but it's not clear that <laughs> we will always observe Kilonova. OK. So another question from King. Was the atomic data means the laboratory data observed in infrared? Infrared, yeah. That's mainly, yeah, yes. So we need a uh, laboratory data so which element and which ionization has a transition in which wavelengths. And also, so basically uh, element ionization and uh, transition wavelengths and the transition probability. We need this kind of information. Otherwise we cannot really identify this element that should have a feature here, here, here. So that, uh, I think collaboration with a laboratory experiment is very important and uh, in, in the long term of the history of astronomy, the optical uh, transition uh, were well measured, but the infrared uh, measurement is still uh, very sparse. So this is, I think, very important uh, area of the research. Thank you for the question. Okay. Okay. A question from Janet. So besides optical and infrared, which information we can get from X-ray or radio? Yes, sorry, I yeah. completely removed and the multi messenger astronomy should include the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic okay. wave. So for the case of the uh, GW17 or H17, uh, X-ray was also detected, radio was also detected. So that was really exciting. Sorry, I, I skipped all of them. So both of the radio and the X-ray was uh, uh, detected. Uh, also gamma ray burst was detected because this also produced a gamma ray burst. Then uh, this uh, high speed material is expanding in, into the interstellar medium. And uh, at the shock front, which uh, it causes a synchrotron emission. So basically, the uh, X ray and radio afterglow is sensitive to the, the very high velocity material and the dynamics of that and the mass of that. So actually, this is extremely important to understand the physics of the neutron star merger. And this was surely observed. And I think one week ago, uh, the, uh, we start to see some flattening of the X-ray uh, emission. And uh, now we can study how much of the material is uh, expanding uh, at the tip of the ejected material. So I think the dynamics of the high energy, high velocity material is well proved by X-ray and radio observation. OK, great. So uh, one more question here. So what would be the implications if the yield of the neutron star mergers was found to be less than observed? On a more naive note, also, is there any chance they could, <laughs> they could overproduce such elements? Would we then have to worry about the, their exhaust, exhaustion? Mm. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we have some solar abundance. So maybe when I make this, we people make this kind of figure, some overproduction can happen. But this is extremely simplified figure. So this figure assumes the solar abundance ratio is applicable to the entire galaxy, which is probably not correct, but <laughs> likely to be incorrect. 
So probably the central part of the galaxy has more alpha set element. Probably outer region has a less uh, element. And unfortunately, this is very hard to know from observation point of view. So if if we make this kind of figure and found the overproduction, then probably that's a shortcoming of our understanding of the galactic structure and our process uh, distribution. If it is underproduced, then probably neutron star merger is uh, not the source of the our process element. And we have to think about the different sources. So that's we have to test in the near future. OK. So yeah, another question is, why does the optical light curve fade it like faster than infrared? Oh, that's very, very expert question. So maybe I have a few. Yes. So I'm sorry for this <laughs> complicated figure, but uh, this is not the spectrum, but uh, this is a uh, absorption efficiency opacity as a function of wavelength and for different elements uh, red one is a uh, uh, lanthanoid and uh, and uh, it, black one is iron so as i said lanthanoid element has a high absorption efficiency at the infrared wavelength because there are lots of excited levels but at the same time such an element has a very even higher absorption uh, efficiency in the optical. So actually, optical emission is really uh, e effectively blocked. So this is the reason why optical emission is also fainter. And also, as time goes by, the temperature of the system get, gets lower. So also, that makes the uh, photon distribution toward longer wavelengths. So these two effects are uh, uh, the reason why optical emission uh, fades faster. So that's a really, yeah, good, good question. Good question. <laughs> okay, good. Any other questions for Masaomi? You want you can also uh, unmute yourself to you know to speak to Masaomi if you want, or send me the message. <clears throat> So I guess the I think the JWST would be nice. I mean, for infrared spectrograph. Yes. Uh, for this kind of kilo domba, if you want to understand more about elements or yeah. In the, in the, for, yeah. But in, uh, honestly speaking, uh, under the current situation, even if we have a, such a beautiful spectrum, we cannot decode the spectrum. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we need more spectrum, but we need more theoretical understanding. I think we right. need we to. Yeah. That's too pity that <laughs> we have some feature here, feature here. So it's, yeah, waiting for identification. Okay. So I remember someone, is there, uh, was there anyone trying to predict how many gold produced uh, well, first Kilonova event? Yes. I, do you remember any? Like thing about this. Did yeah, so a group of people constructed the atomic data of gold and they try to fit, but uh, the, it does not uh, match with any prominent absorption. So okay. that produced, that put the, I think, upper limit of the abundance of the gold, which is extremely uh, not, not so tight. So, okay. Simply because so just upper limits. Yeah, upper limits. Yes. And uh, I think in the future, as you said, uh, the JWST can also detect a later spectrum. And uh, as in supernova, uh, finally the spectrum becomes emission line spectrum. Then we do not suffer from the Doppler shift. Doppler broadening is still there, but uh, we can detect in the rest wavelengths. So probably some of them are already emission line because Kilonova is, has a less material, so it gets optically thin at early time scale. So the, the, what we are in, uh, waiting for uh, with our JWST is also emission line spectrum at the rate time. That's also exciting. Okay. Good. Okay, so we have one new question here from 
again on one. So would it be possible a kiloloma study will unveil the information of island of stability? Do you know what's this information of island of stability? Uh, island of stability, yes, yes. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. And we I think we have more experts in the audience, but yeah, the island of so. stability is a, yeah. <laughs> so there may be some stable nuclei around here. And uh, if uh, some astrophysical phenomena gives the neutron rich environment to reach around here, then uh, we can probably prove the presence or non-existence of such a stable, sorry, even should be around here, uh, yes. And so far from theoretical point of view, the situation is not so neutron rich. And even if we can reach such a neutron rich material, how to prove that? We cannot still, so far we cannot say the presence of uranium in the population. So let me see. Of course, <laughs> if that, Radioactive decay gamma rays are, can be observed, then that will be the same thing now. But unfortunately, the gamma ray detectors are not so sensitive, so we cannot detect the gamma ray uh, from kilonova easily. So I don't know, sorry, uh, I don't know how to use this information uh, to study extremely uh, heavy energy. Okay. So far, yeah, Thank we you. cannot do even, almost anything even for uranium. Right. Great. Any more questions for Masaomi? So I think it's pretty late there in Japan, right? It's like 10.30. That's fine. Yeah, thanks for, yeah, really thanks for staying with us you know, until no that's really late there. So yeah, I think um, if there are no more questions, and uh, it's, we have to thank Masaomi for you know, his fantastic talk. And uh, uh, thanks for everyone to join, you know, for joining. I think it's a pretty successful event. You know, a lot of interesting questions. That means you know, people, they are interested in your talk.